Catch Hello. Hi, everybody. So, my name is Hetty Dambrowska, and I work for Innova. And I'm Grant Evans, and I too work for Innova. And we are application database developers. So what does it mean, application database developers? That means that we work with databases, we develop on databases, but not in the like vacuum. We work with our application developers to make sure our database development suits our application needs and we make our applications the most efficient in the whole universe. So now, uh, I am, yes? Close to the mic. No, I know because I will need to use a pointer, so I cannot bet and I will be always close to this. I will try to speak in this thing, you know. Uh, so, all right. So, you know, uh, I'm a, a teacher and I like to use these long words which people do not understand. So, if somebody was here last year and I was giving a presentation that was all object relational impedance mismatch and all these things, so this year it's like holistic uh, application uh, optimization, database optimization, whatever. So <laughs> what is uh, holistic application tuning? That's what we're talking about here. So we are database developers. We know how to um, optimize SQL queries. We can make our long query run for less than a minute. We can run like, you know, five minute long query in like a couple of milliseconds and so on. We can do this, right? Because we're awesome. So, <laughs> now, Very we know, awesome. Uh, yeah, so like we know, or at least our awesome application developers know how to optimize the usage of application cache. They know how to optimize the um, processing algorithms. So we know all these. However, all those are like separate optimizations. But sometimes optimizing each thing separately like does not work and we want to optimize application to the application as a whole so and that's where is uh, it is holistic application tuning and you know what we found when we like started to work in this area uh, last year I was having difficulties you know being actually accepted to this conference and to several other conferences because it's kind of not database and for software engineers it's kind of not software engineering so it's like very difficult to place uh, researches uh, like this because it does not uniquely belong to any specific field uh, so actually and I will return to this at the end of our presentation now we are trying to define a separate research field for what we are doing. At least we are trying. Okay, now it's your turn. Now we will talk about how it's all started. So, how do we go about doing this and what are we doing exactly? Okay. First of all, uh, what we have at Innova, we're using Postgres. We're you oh, I gotta stand over here. Yeah, so, so all right, I'm just gonna look like a crane. Then. No, no, it's right here, um, that's fine. Oh, right, okay. You remember. <laughs> Sorry, I don't do this very often. Uh, okay. Anyway, we use Postgres. Uh, our or object-oriented language we, of choice is Ruby, and of course we use Active Record for our ORM. Now, some of the problems we have with the ORM, it's great at mapping data structures and bad at handling sets. This leads us to our object relational impedance mismatch, which causes us some problems. And one of the most common complaints of app developers that we hear. What is it? What is the Come most on. common complaint most you Most common hear? complaint. Wake up everybody who works with application developers. What do they tell us, database people? Database is slow. Yes. The database is slow. Click. So why is the database slow? <laughs> well, but okay. Maybe, but we do not tell them that, right? <laughs> We that, want productive that gets, cooperation. That gets into the cultural part <laughs> of impedance mismatch, which we're not covering today. This is not a psychology class. So how do we figure out exactly what is slow? So we use uh, PG Badger a lot. I really like PG Badger. Shameless plug for PG Badger. Everyone should use PG Badger. So how do we use PG Badger exactly? We first of all look at our slowest queries and optimize them. That's pretty obvious, right? As a database person, the first thing you do is go, oh my god, why is that query running in four hours? That's horrible. We fix them, we knock them down in a millisecond. Sometimes we add indexes, sometimes we just have to change the queries. I did one the other day where I simply had to change, they had a date, they were casting something to a date 
I had to cast it back to a timestamp, then it used an index and dropped it down to like 12 Significant. milliseconds Significant. six minutes or something. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of times we knock this first one out really simply. The next one is look at the most frequent queries. And a lot of times these are already fast, they're just run a lot. So we look for things that are fast or that run a lot and are slow and we make them fast. And then the last set that tends to be the hardest ones to get, get rid of are the queries which make, take up the most overall time. So if you have like a one minute query and it runs 10,000 times a day, that's bad, right? But a one minute query, okay, I could buy that, but not when it runs 10,000 times a day. So I'm gonna no. hand this back over to Henrietta and she's gonna show you one of our top offenders. Yes, so meet one of our top offenders. So remember who are top offenders? Queries which eat up total most time. Ta-da. Oops, hold on. Hey. That's our, one of our top offenders. Yes, <laughs> and you got it right, ID is the primary key. Yep. So can you imagine this query being one of the top offenders? You know why? I will tell you why. Guess how many times this query is executed a day in our system? Wild guess. 270,000. 3 million. 10 million. Yeah. <laughs> Who said 10 million? <laughs> pretty close. Yeah. Actually, these are last year numbers, I think now we happily made it to over 10 million. I think last number I saw in UK that was 13 million. Oh, okay. So <laughs> the total execution time, so average execution time is under 10 milliseconds, total execution time two and a half hours. Uh, so you know what it means? It means that two and a half hours a day we are doing select star from loans by primary key, horror, okay? So, uh, Next thing uh, that we uh, actually are being asked, so maybe that's how it should be, maybe that many times, maybe we have so many clients, they actually do this like eight and a half million times. So we actually have an answer for that, you know? And uh, how we know, how we know? No, unfortunately we do not have that many <laughs> customers who do it like eight and a half million times a day. So here are the numbers, because we have statistics about how often each of our controllers of our application run, okay? So, customer account controller, one of the, uh, like each customer who comes to our website, that's what they do, customer account. It's only 50,000 hits during the day, okay? But each of them executes several hundred up to the thousand queries each time they hit this controller. And actually we have some winners because we have some application controllers which execute over 10,000 database calls for each screen rendering. Interesting, right? So now, why? Why we have this miserable situation? Because as we already said, we use Active Record as our ORM. It, you know what, Active Record is not to blame, it's ORM as a whole, okay? So uh, Active Record, how it works. So we have, uh, okay, can I, yeah, I can get it. So here the user hits like whatever, then it goes to web server, then it goes to controller, then it goes to model, goes to views, and then it goes to, I cannot get it, cannot get it. Okay, if I will get it, then I wouldn't get it, the microphone. Okay, so anyway, so it, then it gets to the database. So what's wrong with this picture? Get, well, that's what's wrong with this picture, because by the time we hit database, application developers do not remember what exactly his database. So they are developing, like, you know, on the upper level of this. So when it hits database, nobody knows how many times this controller action actually performs any database calls, okay? So uh, that's where we get uh, several hundred calls per one screen rendering. So then, here comes the... Here comes the entertainment portion of today's show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so when you tell your application developers their application is slow, the first thing they say, well, let's buy more hardware, <laughs> right? Hell yeah, put more, put more nodes up. So I mean, our Postgres databases are already pretty good. You can see the stats there. I'm not going to go through them. The, the take home here is that basically for us to double our, our performance on the database side, we're looking at a million bucks per cluster. <laughs> Right, so that's really not, not feasible. Yeah, and so, it only will speed us up twice yeah. when we need to be sped up like at least 10 times. Yeah, so I, I, I'd rather have a bonus than spend a million bucks on, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. okay, 
So the problem here is, you know, if we continue with doing what we've been doing, you know, building more apps, adding more hardware, the problem never really goes away. We still have the same situation. It just eventually we're going to run out of scalability and we're not going to be able to buy more hardware and we're not going to be able to go faster. Yeah. So that's why like about two years ago, we came up with a new solution, which we call logic split. And nobody likes this word. Everybody, when they their first time, say, oh, we will come up with a better name. But nobody did so far. So you know, the, you know, it's open competition. Please feel free to uh, kind of come up with a better name. <coughs> so what uh, our approach allows, allows us to reduce the number of database calls, where we have like single number of database calls instead of like several hundreds per screen rendering, and also to um, optimize queries independently from the app. Because you know what? If one application controller does this like several hundred select star from loan, it's not much you can optimize. You know, if it executes for five seconds instead of one second, like you can do nothing. So now we can optimize database access and we can optimize applications. So what is the magic? So how are we going to achieve that? We are going to make Ruby methods data aware. And that is complete heresy. It's like very contrary to the old standard of object-oriented development. But uh, there's basically like no way to get around this. Either we just implement absolutely new approach or we'll continue to have the similar problems. So like the idea, and uh, so far, actually, I'm just, you know, talking about our methodology, so like if somebody by any chance remember what was here last year, so far it was pretty much what we had last year. So um, that is what we are proposing here. So instead of having each method going to the database with their queries separately, we introduce additional method which would uh, go to the database, return data set, and then the rest of the methods will use this data set implementing their methods logic but not going to the database for each and single number. So, um, you know, when I first came up with these ideas and with a group of very dedicated application developers who were willing to play all these crazy games of mine and implement this. So first it was like, okay, Hattie doing her magic. So it was like Hattie's way and nobody like can reproduce it. So since then, we were trying very hard to make it, if not industry, at least kind of craftsmanship, so it can be learned and like distributed as a knowledge. So um, we came up with uh, basically the steps how we analyze each application controller, how we can rewrite it. So first, we disassemble this method into atomic steps. From these steps, identify ones which require data retrieval. Using the knowledge about database objects, construct a single query or a couple of queries, and then execute this query and use this uh, data on the future steps. So now I will fast forward through one example, because it's a big example, we probably do not want to have that much Ruby on the database conference, but you know, I want to give you guys an idea how it all works. So one of the methods we um, disassembled, that was our first experiment, is uh, accounts outstanding. So the definition is, so accounts outstanding, so what is the outstanding amount for the loan? So it consists of like one, two, three, whatever, several uh, methods, okay? So each of these methods uh, was interacting with the database independently. So that is the UML diagram of how this method works. And you know what, like, do not ask me because I'm not a programmer, I do not know about UML, so my favorite application developers actually created this UML diagram for me. So what we really uh, want to see here, uh, there are like a whole bunch of calls. So look at this one, some account, some account, <coughs> some account. So this is thing which is being repeated. And uh, if you look here, you can see these arcs, which actually tells us that been repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. Uh, and uh, if you want to know what is the sum account, that is actually 
the SQL, which is executed in our Postgres database, and it's very simple SQL, that's it. So just selecting all balances for all loans. Like Now, after we execute it, that's what we have. We actually do have all the balances right here in our application. But does the method know about it? No, it does not, because it's only interested in this one particular single balance. So then it will execute the same SQL again and again and again when it needs to get all the balances for this loan, which results in such beautiful numbers in our PG Badger log, which is, uh, and if you are wondering what are these twos and threes here, do you guess what, what's it? This was like our last year list of top offenders. So these uh, queries were happily making number two and number three of top offenders. So this SQL have been executing like um, several hours each day. Uh, so how we modify this method, it was very simple. So again, it's like a UML diagram. So the only thing you can see now that these multiple arches are gone and instead of executing some account multiple times, we execute one optimized some account, which has this matching select. So actually, if you look at this, you'll see it's exactly the same select, nothing changes. It's executed exactly as long as previous ones, but it just executed once because we identify all the balances we need to retrieve and feed these balances with their names to the Ruby method, which gave us like very nice improvement. So um, this was the statistics from the like smaller database from the dark testing, which basically tells us that we improve performance uh, like four times on this method. Now, guess what happened next? When we're very proud of our achievements. Our application developers got unhappy. <laughs> you know why? Hold on. You know why? why? Why application developers got unhappy? Okay, that's close. Okay, go, 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 get it. What about our business logic? <laughs> business logic belongs in the application, not the database. <laughs> what gives? You know, we need the business logic to execute joins and selects. And our, our results and transformations that are done in the application need application logic. We can't do that in the database. We can't push that stuff through. Actually, that was very dramatic because I remember my manager coming to me and said, hey, you know what, we need to roll back everything you did. Everything was so cool, but you know what, I'm sorry, we cannot keep business logic in the database. So that was like a very dramatic thing and it was like brainstorming because we still wanted to have our methods running really fast. But I understood there is no way I have to share. I cannot take all business logic to me, so, you know. So we came to this compromise of splitting logic to the application logic and database logic. Okay, no, that's my, okay, that's, yep. that's me anyway. Sure, I love to talk, you know. <laughs> yeah, because I'm a teacher, right? So uh, again, uh, this one, again, we will just fast forward. Um, what I want to show here, and that, uh, that's about how we reuse our logic. So uh, basically the method we were showing before, it was just a method which would calculate one number, one amount. So obviously when you have like a big screen like this, loan summary, uh, I will do close up, don't worry. You um, actually need to have many amounts and many um, fields displayed. So close of view here. So those are some details of the loan and if you, do not think anything bad about this loan. You would think that everything which belongs to loan actually is stored in the loan table, which is not true. Some of these fields are actually stored in the loan table, but some of them are results of very complicated calculations. So we still have to have this calculation logic in the application, but we still know where these details are coming from. So what we do? We have one big select statement which selects everything what we need to populate this screen and to compute something. Then, this is our data set method. Then we have two small Ruby methods here which calculate amounts using our data which is already pulled from the database. And now, look what we are doing. So we have this data set which we are returning. Then we pass 
some of our database values to the method. Then this method calculates it and returns the result as a virtual column to the same data set. So it's still one database call. We still preserve the application logic and we still can do it like in one shot. So again, total breach of uh, object-oriented technology. Uh, so that was how we kind of uh, made the made convinced application developers that we can be trusted, right? So now, here comes other magic, how we are doing it on Postgres side, because so far it was all about application. Here go. Next one. Uh -huh. So, how exactly did we do this? We used a bunch of set returning functions. Uh, basically what we did is we built a script that functions similarly to an Oracle package in that you have a bunch of different objects inside one script, right? Yeah, because hint, hint, Postgres doesn't have packages. Yeah, yeah, yeah somebody <laughs> needs to get on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what we did, like I said, we use uh, set returning functions, and the set returning functions are all dynamic. Okay. Yes, oh, I need to get closer. Yes. Okay, I'm not channeling NASB enough. <laughs> um, so each function builds its own SQL based on the parameters that are provided to the function by the application. And I'll show a demo of this in a little bit. The functions also now serve as, as a contract, basically, between the database and the application. The application knows what it needs to provide us, we know what we're gonna get, and the application always knows what it's gonna get back. This frees us up to do anything we want on the database side. We can change the models, we can use inheritance, we can do whatever we want. App Dev doesn't really care as long as the function returns the same values. So our, a little package example here, and like I said, the reason I'm calling it a package is just because we have different object types inside the same script. Yeah, and uh, about like typing, right? Because we need to define this specific <coughs> record structure. Oh, for this. Yeah. right. So we, we create our types here, and our types are conserved by all the functions inside the package. And I'll show an example of how we've actually uh, handled the selection of those data inside the function and passed that into a, a uh, basically refactored that portion yeah, out. Yeah, so uh, the problem is we cannot really return the record because application needs to know what we're returning. Right, yeah. right, we can't just return a random record. So the type is actually, the type is our return contract. I mean, we promise the app that they will get this back every time they call the function, mm -hmm. regardless of what they put into the function. What we put into the function. What we put into the function. What the method puts into the function. <laughs> so what happens if we need to actually change the structure of the function? Well, the output, structure of the output. The output parameters mm -hmm. of the function. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't do a replace function if you change the output parameter data types, so you have to drop the function. And then we end up dropping the type, and then we drop. create the type again, and then we create the function again. And again, this is all done inside one script, and I'll show you the script, and it'll be a little more sensible. Yeah. I'll come so, to the next question. <laughs> is this reusable? Like, what the hell are you talking about? Did you just build a 30,000-page function? No, it's not really that bad. No, um, but it's a big function, so yeah. Next thing, after we were done with application developers, database developers were at our back. So, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah, what do you get to do with this function? In, in our defense, this function is only 380 lines <laughs> long. It's not that big. <laughs> I mean, really, come on, 380 lines. And most of that is comments for me. <laughs> so, how do, we, how do we go about refactoring this without losing our main advantage, which is the reduction of the number of database calls? So, First thing we do is we use polymorphism. Okay, Grant, you need to get oh. your finger now. No, you need to get oh, your... Yes, ma'am. You need to get your example now. Yes, ma'am. Okay. This is your slide anyway. Yeah, that's my slide. Here is, so and here is was, your connector. Yeah, okay, hold on. Now you know what it's like wrong. Okay, uh, yeah, so uh, actually, you know, um, this, uh, like on Wednesday, on the workshops, actually, there was rightly pointed so that polymorphism now became a very, very polymorphic word because like from old school people like myself, polymorphic are the functions which uh, can uh, get different 
set of parameters of different types and still like be the same function. It's nothing to do with new Postgres polymorphic types. It's like the original programming meaning. So what we want, we want to have the same function which would process different set of parameters. And I do not really like the word overload uh, in this context, though it's like Postgres word, because it basically means that something is better than the other. And here it's like all functions are equal. Yes. Just, Mm -hmm. Yes. No, you do not need to laser. You, you, you cannot use it. You'll have to use your mouse. I can point to the screen and use the mouse. No, you cannot. Because <laughs> Grant, you cannot. You know why? Because I owe the powers. <laughs> well, I can use the laser pointer. Okay. See? All right. Laser all right. pointer still Okay. Works. All right. You can use my laser pointer. Ooh, okay. But that, that didn't work so well, did it? All right. I need, I need two hands to drive my mouse. Mama Bear wins again. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so what I want to show here, uh, first of all, is this polymorphism example that Henriette is talking. So I'm going to scroll through some of this stuff. We have two functions with the exact same name here. And you'll notice that the input types, we've got uh, string, integer, var car, text, right? So great. You'll notice that these last three parameters are conserved for both functions and the first one changes. So when I scroll way down past all this stuff, to show you the next example, same function name, but it's now accepting an integer array. Okay. So you want to, uh, want to tell how it started, why we had to do them twice? Or you want me to tell it? You can tell. Because I can tell, you're, I can talk. Better at I can that talk. Part I can I talk. Yeah. So originally, this uh, function was created to perform Google type search for our uh, customer service reps because they start typing. We do not know what they're typing. They can type email, uh, the customer last name, or whatever, the phone number, and the function needs to figure out actually what we are, what we are doing. And uh, then, um, we got a new platform and we got service-oriented architecture. And now, depending on what we're searching, we had different functions and different functions they had to run from different clusters. And you know what we get to do then? Then we get to uh, just search in one cluster and then return the found accounts to the other cluster, and then we still had to have the same output. So basically, the second version of the function was picking the results from the search from the other cluster. So that's why it's like, what it has to do, string and set of integers. So string is the actual search string, and the set of integers is a result of the execution of other search function. So that's how it works. Now, uh, Next thing, the other way to fact, uh, refactor, use separate function for select list. Actually, now you can talk. Now you, you can just talk about what, what we're doing here. Okay. So basically what I did here. Um, yeah, and that's a, what he did a, because I was block, lazy. That's he did. <laughs> of, I mean, we had, we had this block of just of select columns that was about this long that was the same in both functions. Right? And if we needed to change that, we'd have to change it in two places. So the logical thing to do is just factor out that block. Right? So that's exactly what I did. I created a simple little SQL function that take, took that block of SQL, turned it into text, and spits it out wherever I want. So if we need in the future to change that, we just change it in one place, and it's automatically applied to both. Yes. Yeah. And the important part here that we do not really break select into two select. So this part, which is refactored. Yeah. Ready? It's, Ready? It's Ready? Thinking. 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 It's Think faster. It's hey. Hey, look at that. The technical problems. Woohoo. No, 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 no. Ah. Yes, my laptop went to sleep. Gosh. I know. Look at that. Sleep. Okay. It's a security feature. <laughs> okay. All right. So basically, what we did is this is the giant blob of select text that I'm talking about. I'm gonna make it slightly smaller so it'll all fit in the screen. And this is basically, like I said, just the common, the common data that we have to return to the application. This is really the entire projection for that query. Mm -hmm. So we factor it out, we made it a new function which follows my extremely long and wordy naming standards. And then we place that function back into the original function. 
So when this thing builds itself, it just executes that really quickly, gets the text back, and it goes into its assembly steps. Okay. You want to you want to talk about how we oh, we'll, we'll talk about on the next slide about why we break it here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Next one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, this function is called smart search for the reason, because as we already mentioned, it's pretty smart. It's pretty smart. Yes. Function is pretty smart because it has to be smart because we do not know what our users want to look for. So we need to accommodate search on different attributes. And we cannot do text search, though we emulate Google search, but it's not search for like words and text. It's actually different fields that we want to search for. So because of that, we have pretty sophisticated algorithm of generating how this actual SQL will look, okay? So uh, now go. Now we go back to the example. Yeah, now we go back to the example. Back to the example. Yes. We did this to keep you all awake. Yes, absolutely. That was the idea. Because yeah. if she lets me explain this whole query, we'll be here for like four hours. Yes. No. Everything is timed. <laughs> hey, look at that. No security features. <laughs> cool. So the part of the query that is really smart is this lovely little section right here that interprets what the application is providing us based on... I'm going to call them hints for lack of better vernacular of what the application provides to us. So the application gives us hints. We can't give the planner hits, but the application can give us hints. That's another little plug for what we want. So <laughs> yes. the application we gives us some hints, and based on what the application is providing into a text field, we interpret what it means. And I mean, you, you can see some of the, the logic that's going on there, and it basically results in additional uh, constraints being added to the query that modify the, the select statement, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of having multiple functions with multiple selects or multiple methods in the app that are pulling different things, we have it in one place and it just builds itself based on what you want it to find. Yes. And it is very quick and very cool. Okay. So uh, yeah, now, now yeah, you, you, I will I'm back plug. to my final slide? Yes, you are back to your final slide and okay. then it will be my final slide, okay? Because we as this presentation well, for two, we have final, two. final is nebulous here. We're defining. No, actually, no, no, no. Ah, it will be also my You're showcase. You're not getting that lucky. No, it will be also my showcase. Okay, advantages. Well, okay, where did the magic thing go? Magic thing, right here. Put yeah. the magic thing down. Yeah. Okay, so what are the advantages of, this, of the advantages of this method? The first thing is it decouples the application API from the database API, which, like I said earlier, basically allows us to do whatever we want to the database and the app developers don't care. Uh, we can change the underlying data structures, we can vertically partition, normalize, denormalize, whatever, do whatever you want as a database developer and the app doesn't care. As long as you continue to return that type, the app doesn't care or shouldn't care. <laughs> it reduces complexity at the AppDB interface because that interface becomes that one type that type definition is our promise to the application of what we're going to do. And it vastly improves efficiency of the entire system. Yes. And now we need to, yeah, to, show, to show off how okay. we improve it. Now, Henrietta is very proud of these next slides because it's basically the proof is in the pudding. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, these are, again, last year results, but I still want to showcase them because it shows, you know, how, how we drastically improved our performance. Uh, so... First, like uh, some of you guys probably familiar with New Relic, right? So New Relic shows like uh, basically uh, about your application. It can show like your average page load time and level of customer satisfaction. So you can see we have two old applications and one new application and it's new because the significant portions of this new application were written using this new technology. So you can see here all three applications have similar load during the day, okay? So average page load time, almost seven second one, like five and a half seconds one, and half a second, guess why? That's why. It's only a slight improvement, huh? Yeah, yes. And uh, yeah, uh, if you look at the level of user satisfaction, it's also slight improvement, right? We're pretty proud of it. 
So um, I was asked at some point to uh, put together the results for uh, most um, improved controllers, so that is this table. And when I first presented this table, so uh, my managers told me, hey, you know what, salespeople uh, or like business people do not like to look at the tables. You need to create a graph which will show graphically how much you improved. Which um, was, you know, and that was very miserable. I'm showing you a graph, okay, because now here you can see the numbers, right? Numbers are Numbers are impressive, I know, right? So now look at the graph. Graph is absolutely not impressive, you know why? Because you cannot see the red. <laughs> the red is like actually the uh, number of executions for the new app versus the old app for the same controllers. And this is like the other graph about average execution seconds. So see, can you see red? Can you see red? Like red? A little sliver. That's yeah. All that's left. <laughs> yeah. So I, I still think that uh, you know uh, when you have the table, you at least can see the seconds. Like the little sliver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I especially love this graph. So one of our interns created it for us. That the capturing of the performance uh, actually got from Euratic into Mathematica. Uh, how uh, one controller improved performance after we implemented the new technology. It was actually instantaneously, as you can see, like during business hours. So yeah, that was pretty darn impressive, <laughs> I guess. So uh, yeah, that's, now we can save both time and money. And we are not stopping here, because now we are moving to a new platform, and we are continuing to separate logic from Ruby code, because interestingly, Anybody has any business logic in your applications anywhere from the application code? Raise your hands, because we do not have it. <laughs> and for most of the applications, the logic is in the code. So we need to extract this logic from the Ruby code, verify with business stakeholders, reuse, uh, write, and move on, and improve. Okay, and slide. We're not done yet, one sec. Okay, one more sec. No, I, I, have, I have a couple of minutes. So first of all, uh, like remember I mentioned that we are trying to establish as a separate research field. So I am trying to submit a workshop proposal for one of the big conferences. So that's my work, uh, workshop proposal. So please, if you are interested in this field, join my efforts. Tell me you want to participate. I'd like to participate. Yeah, because then you, you know you know where I'm trying to do it for uh, ICD 2016. It will be in my hometown, I, in Saint Petersburg, Russia. So yeah, you I need really to come there. Participate. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, and last one. Yes, this one's mine. It's yours. It's yours. We are hiring. <laughs> if anyone is interested in pursuing this kind of technology, come talk to us. Yeah, you'll work with me. Just you work with him. Send me a resume. <laughs> okay, now that's it. We're done. We're done. Questions. Okay. Hey, we finished under time. Yes. That's it's impressive. Difficult. It's impressive for me. You know how I like to talk. I always like Well, when we, we practiced this on uh, Wednesday or Thursday night, one of those nights, and we went for an hour and a half. <laughs> All right, questions? Yes, yes, yes. You're first. <laughs> so you said you've been sort of struggling with a better name than logic split. Yes. Um, have you compared this to a data access object? I think the name for this pattern is data access object. Uh, you know what, probably you are right because what we are doing, we basically are building presenters, mm -hmm. but still, uh, you know, the problem which we are really like trying to address is really like what goes to the database, what goes to the application. Right. So what was important for me, and that was probably the most difficult part for me when we were working on this, uh, gosh, I, I stepped away from it. He's right. it's <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, it's uh, basically like uh, figuring out how we preserve all advantages and not hugging all the logic, which we would love, you know, because I came from my previous projects for like last 15 years, that's what I was doing. I said, application, I will give you everything, you just get to display it. And it did not work in this environment. So we just, so that's, that's what I was trying to stress when I was naming it logic split. Yes? Um, I like what you did where you had a data type that was defined as a contract between app and database. Mm -hmm. But why couldn't you also just push up your interface up a little bit higher into some Ruby or into an application? 
Like, yep. why so hard split at database versus like Active Directory? When you could just as easily say, all right, well, our data database people get to own something about Active Record, and app developers don't get to get their fingers down there. We're, at, we're actually working on that, yes. and it, it really depends on the people that are involved. We're kind of low on database developers right now. Yeah. On our new platform, there's like, what, five of us? <sighs> okay. I. We have I, six, I six openings. Hiring, okay. right? I, I, I can hire we're like hiring. six people on the spot. Okay. So <laughs> the, the, the reality of, of the answer to that question is yes, and we've looked at that, and I've personally looked at it. Um, there's just so much work that we have to do on the database side at Innova that it, it actually is hard for us to build up the skill set in Ruby to actually become that proficient. That's yeah. been a problem for me personally. Yeah. No, for, for all of us, um, basically, yeah, for all of us, yeah. So, and we do actually have some really, really, really freaking brilliant app developers that are pretty good with SQL and they are starting to go that way. I think the natural progression is actually gonna come kind of both directions and there's gonna be a merge in the middle. And this is probably just one uh, tool or communication mechanism that's gonna end up driving that split yeah. as people get more familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And also now we're trying to put it in like our main models because when we, when we first started it, you still need to have a model to uh, like read this. So it turned, uh, you know, in two parallel models, like for the old world and for the new world. So now we are actually moving kind of slow in our new platform by trying to avoid this, this kind of split because that's not what we want. And we're trying to make sure that all our app developers are like in sync and this will be like the foundation for all presenters. So whichever application you it, it's like. It's a lot of compromise and it really, you know, we get into rooms with app developers and it's a, it's a talk about where we're gonna put things and it really depends on what they want and what we want and what resources we can put on the problem and where things end up falling out. Yeah.